All right, the next thing we're talking about here is when I take a propositional function, say for example, what we did before, say a square and a triangle and a star is denoting that a square squared plus a triangle squared is equal to a star squared, right? Remember, these are just simply things that are meant to be replaced. And so how would I turn something like this and a propositional function is not a proposition. So if it's not a proposition, can I make it a proposition from a proposition function? So how would I do that? Well, the way that we do that is a process, and there's a three step, three ways to do this. And overall, this is called binding the variables. And the first one is just straightforward evaluation. We've already done that, and so if that's our thing, we would have that p of three, four, five which would denote 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared. Well, that particular thing is just simply true. But on the other hand, p of 1, 1, 1, which denotes 1 squared plus 1 squared is supposed to be 1 squared. We look at this, well, 2 is not 1. This is false, All right? So I can bind the variables, which means just simply the, the variables are unknown objects, right? I can just go ahead and take objects out of my universe of discourse, shove them in, get a true or get a false. That's one process of binding. It's just simply evaluation. It's just simply take objects, single or many, however many, from the universe of discourse, right? Now, particular ones. The other one is going to fall underneath the title, and the other two of these are going to fall underneath the title the next two are called quantification. And there's two types of quantification. So, I don't like the number two there. And so, first way that we did this was evaluation. The next two, which is going to be two and three, is going to be called universal quantification and then one after that is going to be called existential quantification. All this is universal quantification, existential quantification is these are just simply the words all or some. I suppose we could, instead of all, I could say all of or some of. And so what we're doing is really just getting to this idea of for all objects in the universe of discourse, the predicate is true, right? And that's where we get this idea of universal. In other words, what we're doing is just simply saying that, you know what, if I would go through the entire universe of discourse and test everything in that entire universe of discourse, I'm always going to get a true. Uh, the notation for such is, well, all is the big word. I could, A would be nice, but I, A could be confusing as, as if it's an actual function name. And so what we rather do is use an A, but turn it upside down. But it's all what? Well, x is allowing us to say, I'm taking everything from the universe of discourse where that's coming from, and then we have our predicate. And this is red. For all x in the universe of discourse, the predicate holds. P of x holds. Okay, existential quantification is for some x in, and when I mean some, I actually mean one or more x in the universe of discourse. The 
per, per etiquette is true. Uh, the notation for this is, well, uh, existential, there exists, is what we're talking about, and so we're going to use an E. But if I took an E and flipped it like I did the A, it would still look like an E, so we go the other way. So it's a backwards E. There exists something within the universe of discourse that the predicate holds, and we say, for some X in the universe of discourse, P of X. Another way of, of saying the exact same thing as we would go through that is to say, instead of saying for some X in the universe of discourse of X, P of X, we could also say there exists an X in the universe of discourse such that P of X. That's another way of saying it. I mean, like the there exists is because of the E. And so we have some X in the universe of discourse, either one or more, such that the P of X itself actually holds as we do this. Now, one of the questions we could have on this is, um, now that we have these sentences, when are these sentences true and when are these sentences, when are these sentences false? So if I would have the for all x, p of x, and I would compare this to there is a, exists some x such that p of x actually holds, when is this true? Well, this is true if for all x in the universe of discourse, p of x is true. When is it this one? Well, it's going to be true if for one or more x in the universe of discourse p of x is true. On the other hand, when is this false? If you're telling me everybody has a property, the way this is false is if I can find one or more people who do not have that property, which means we have one or more x in the universe of discourse such that p of x is false. On the other hand, when would be the existential be false? If I'm telling you, hey, there's at least one person here who has this, well, the only way that could be false is if everybody doesn't, which would mean that for all x in the universe of discourse, p of x is false. Uh, this one here is of particular interest in that it gets its own word. Um, if you're wanting the universal statement that this is always true, but it ends up being that what you said, like all men are pigs, all right? When is that false? Well, if you can give me one thing that happens, and this one or more, this particular technique is called a counter example, right? If it's not true for one thing, that's the counter example for somebody that just said for all. And this is an important feature of when you want to show something, like if, if a person comes up with a universal statement, all of these have this. An important thing is the only way I can show that is if I show that is true for everyone. Uh, we can take a variant if we simply say, for example, what if the universe of discourse is finite, and so we get x1, x2, all the way up to xn are the objects. So if that's true, if I just have you know like n objects, that would mean that for all x, p of x, which would mean go around the room. Hey, person one, do you have this property? Hey, person two, do you have this property? Hey, person three, do you have this one? And you just keep on going until you check if everybody has the property. And the only way this is true is if everybody is true. So it's conjunctive. It, everybody must say yes for it to be true, right? And so when I look at this, I would notice that hey, who's the dominator? The dominator is a false. If at any time a person would come up and say no, there's your counterexample. The entire thing immediately becomes false. This would be an immediate, one person says no, counterexample, it's all wrong because it's conjunctive. On the other hand, if a person would say, hey, someone in this room has this property. 
Well, how would you do that? You would keep going around. Person one, person two, person three, person n. And when I do this, the moment any one person says yes, well, then you'd be right. And so this is disjunctive. If anybody says yes, so if a person would come in here and say, person one, do you, are you a, we'll actually go around here and say that this is a, you know, chair, are you a person? No. Chair, book, are you a person? No. Mark, are you a person? The moment he would say true, it dominates because true dominates or. And so the entire thing would be yes. So that's existential in nature. And so from this, it's easy to see that the moment we have one false, the entire thing's false. That's why we call this thing a counterexample to the universal statement. And that's kind of special about universal things. It's also important that a lot of times we're trying to discuss things in a universal way. Everything has this feature because I'd like to act in this particular technique or statement. The other thing that happens here is obviously De Morgan's. De Morgan's allows us to, what would happen if I would negate? It's not the case that everyone has a property. Well, if that's true, that negation would go through the conjunction. But every one of those ands would become ors, and I would have not on all of these, but a bunch of ors is actually an existential. So what does this mean? This is logically the same as there exists something where it's not true. Well, that's your counterexample. Doesn't that make sense? It's not true that everybody is a pig. Well, what does that mean? There's somebody out there who is not a pig, right? In other words, if it's not true that it's always true, someone out there didn't have it hold. You have found a counterexample. On the other hand, if you tell me, you know, it's not true that someone has this predicate. Well, the only way that can happen is, is I tested everybody and they all said no. So that meant everybody's been tested and it's not true that they have that feature. So if you're telling me no one, it's not true that someone has a property, then everyone does not, right? So negation has, we have a De Morgan's law of distribution. So negation goes through universals, makes them existentials. Negation goes through existentials, it makes them universals. So we can bind objects with substitution. We can bind these variables with saying the word all, and we bind these things with saying the word sum. So the next thing we'll do is now that we know how to bind these, we know how to work with them and write them out, we'll actually use them in application.